you just like to lift your hands right now and worship him? Jesus, we worship you tonight. Lord, we're so grateful for your sweet presence. Thank you that we can come into your presence, Lord. We don't have to have any special calling, any special anointing, Lord. Just the desire of our heart to enter into your presence. We give you glory and praise in this place tonight. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm so thankful for the house of the Lord, a place where we can come together. I heard Pastor, I think it was at the Pekin campus on Sunday, he said, he repeated something I said. It just rolled off the tongue last Sunday, but it really is so true. I said, I love to come to church with people who love to come to church. It's just something about being in the presence of other people that want to celebrate the presence of God. And it just, I believe that that draws in the precious presence of the Lord that we experience so often in this place. And it, does, it isn't always the same, but it's always good. I said it's all, Brother Keith, it's always good. I love being in the presence of the Lord. It's just a lifter. The psalmist said he's the lifter of my head. He lifts up my soul, my spirit, and uh, I'm so grateful for the presence of the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Invite the ushers if they will come tonight. Wait on us for our tithe and offering. Looking forward to hearing Bishop bring the word here in just a little while. It'll be the first time in a while. He said, forget what he said. He said it'll be the quick as 10 minutes or he'll probably repeat whatever he said but it was something to the effect that he felt like he didn't know if he had it or not and I'm like yeah right <laughs> we just sit at the kitchen table and I just mentioned one thing and brother we're off on a 45 minute dissertation so it don't take much to stir those deep waters father we're so grateful to be in your house in your presence to celebrate you with the people of God I pray you'd have your way in this place God encourage and strengthen us Lord this midweek service I pray you'd give us strength for the remainder of this week give us vision and place a word in our spirit I pray that you'd strengthen Bishop Lord anoint him to preach the word speak the word with passion unction and anointing bless us as we give and we'll give you glory in Jesus name
I just want more of you, Lord, because I know that you know what's best for me. You'll provide exactly what I need. Hallelujah. I'm convinced that there is so much more of God than we'll ever get in this lifetime. So we can just keep on reaching. You never reach that apex, that zenith in God. That won't happen until we cross to the other side. And I don't want to become complacent. I don't want to become apathetic towards the things of God. I want to continue. God, show me something new in your word today. Show me something I've never seen before. You believe God's able to do that? I don't care if you've been serving the Lord for decades. He can show you a brand new thing today. Come on, I pray the Lord do that tonight as Bishop brings the word. God bless you. Fellowship with one another. Youth, children, you're dismissed to your classes. Encourage one another in the Lord.
have fought hell for two days. I stand before you. I told my wife, I said, I, I know this is not true, but I think this way. I feel like a man clawing his way up out of his own grave. Brain fog, lack of ability to consistently focus. For the first several weeks after I got home from the hospital, I couldn't even read my King James Version Bible. I just couldn't. I couldn't focus on a verse. So I got me a third grade children's Bible and found that I could only read it for a couple of chapters and then my mind would go foggy on me. Um, I told the doctor the other day, he said, how are you doing? I said, well, I suppose for the condition I'm in, I said, but I picked up a couple of life travelers that I can't kick out, I won't get rid of them. He said, who? I said, one's called weakness and the other's called weariness. And so I stand before you a very weak and weary man tonight. I remember a story about a, a lady who invited the pastor home on a Sunday for a meal and uh, cheek fried chicken. Her little boy had a dog, as most country boys do. And uh, he tried to steal a piece of chicken and take it to the dog. And his mother, of course, being eagle-eyed as mothers are, spied it in the process and stopped it before it got started. After the preacher came and after they had eaten and after they had fellowshiped and uh, his mother called him in, gave him a platter full of bones and whatever that you're not supposed to feed dogs, but he took that little platter of scraps out and he said to Fido, he said, Pup, I had you a real nice offering in mind, but all you got now is a collection. <laughs> so I, I struggled really, truly to bring you a, a good word of the Lord, but all you get now is a collection. Okay, if you'll open your Bible to Psalms 59, I want to read verses 1 through 3, maybe verses 1 and 2, and then we'll get to 3. This is an epistle, or no, this is a psalm that David wrote on the occasion when his father-in-law, King Saul, possessed of a demonic spirit, sent men to David's house to watch for him and to kill him. When they, you read the story of that in 1 Samuel 19, it's a real wonderful, intriguing chapter. You ought to read it. This wife of David is Saul's daughter, Michelle. She's the same woman that later, when David became king, mocked him as he danced before the Ark of the Covenant, bringing it into Israel. She's the same one that the Lord said he would shut up her womb and she would bear no children. As I was studying this and pondering it, I realized to mock the king is a death penalty. To mock the king. She could have and should have died. And I asked myself, is it possible that because she spared David's life when her father would have killed him, that God spared her life when she mocked the anointed. But even though he spared her life, he refused her the privilege of motherhood. So we read this psalm. It's written during that setting. Saul sent his men to get him, get David, and Michelle says he's sick. They leave and Saul says, go back and bring him to me in his bed that I can kill him. 
And when they came back, by the time they got back, Michelle had already convinced David, you need to flee for your life. David said, I'll go tomorrow. She said, if you wait till tomorrow, you'll be a dead man. And so she persuaded him to flee. And then she put a dummy looking contraption into the bedclothes to make it appear that it was him. And when the guys came back a second time, they uh, realized they'd been tricked. They went to Saul. He summonsed his daughter. And he said, why have you done this? And of course, she made excuses and got out of it. But uh, then Saul inquired, where has he gone? And she said, he's gone to Nioth, N-A-I-O-T-H, in Ramah. Nioth means a shepherd's camp. And it just happened to be the camp where Samuel and all the presiding prophets in that area were living. And David fled there. When Saul found out, he sent his men to get David. He still determined to kill him. And when they got there, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon them, and they began to prophesy. And they went back. And he sent another, or sent him a second time, sent him a third time. Finally, he got so frustrated that he went himself. And when he approached the shepherd's camp, the Spirit of the Lord came upon this demon oppressed, at least, if not possessed, disobedient, rebellious king, and he went into an ecstasy of prophesying. And uh, that's all interesting in the 19th chapter of Samuel, and that's the background for this 59th Psalm. You'll enjoy reading it. Psalms 59 and 1, Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God, and defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. Deliver me, defend me, deliver me, and save me. Prayer of a man whose life has been targeted by the one that should have supported him and covered for him and appreciated him but instead he was targeted. He wasn't targeted because he had been disobedient or unlawful or done that which was wrong. Look at verse 3 and you'll see why he was targeted. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty, that is those that are authorized by the king himself, the mighty have gathered against me not because of my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. Why was David targeted? The same reason, if you have dedicated your life to God, you are targeted. Now, whether you realize it or not, we who endeavor to live for God or in the midst, we're caught up in the midst of a war. It has nothing to do with us personally. How many of you ever heard me ask the question, have you ever seen a school album? Some of us have to really stretch our memory a long way. Can you remember looking through a school album, the pictures of classmates, and you'd find this one that's got big ears drawn on it, uh, or mustache on a girl, a beard, before they were ever popular, you know. Uh, you know, even some of them, they literally took a pen and stabbed them in the eyes. Anybody ever seen that beside me? They really didn't care about the picture. That shows you what that individual would have loved to have done to that individual if they could have gotten away with it. So since they couldn't get away with venting their rage on the person, they vented their rage on the photo. How many of you realize that you are basically a photo of God made in his image and in his likeness and then regenerated with his anointing so that 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. He didn't just work a 
one creation in the natural, but he worked a greater creation in the spiritual that through birth, new birth of water and spirit, John 3, 3 through 8, Acts 2, 37 through 39, that through that new birth experience, old things passed away. We're talking spiritual now. If you were redheaded when uh, you received the Holy Ghost, it didn't turn blue. Hello? If you were short, you didn't get tall. If you were fat, it didn't put you on a quick diet. It, it's not talking about physical things. It's talking about spiritual and moral things. All things, uh, old things have passed away. I was dead in trespasses and sins, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, 3. And, uh, but now I'm alive unto God. Hello? That changed. Oh, thank God. It made me thank God it changed. You don't know what I was. I'd remember what I was, but thank God I'm no longer what I was. The saying says, I, I know I'm not what I ought to be and I'm not what I want to be but thank God every day I'm not what I used to be I become a new creature in Christ Jesus old things passed away now I am a part of the body of Christ the bride of Christ the church of the living God I represent him as an ambassador of God and Satan would like to punch my eyes out you too my subject tonight is you a target you're not a target because you are so strong or powerful in yourself there is a spirit of Sam, of Samson and I, I see it affecting uh, saints and I'm not talking about this congregation but I see it across the country affecting people that have been a part of the kingdom so long I see it affecting preachers that have been a part of the ministry so long that they've learned how and they can carry on without God, they think. Sam Samson learned how to yield, but he couldn't. He got so far from God that the Bible says on that fateful day, he was not even aware, he wished not that the anointing of the Lord was gone and he went out and shook himself as before but now he's just an ordinary guy now he is a uh, weakling and he's a target and they bind him and they punch out his eyes and then they put him grinding like a donkey at a gristmill, pushing a, a long lever around so that the wheel of upper wheel grinds against the lower wheel as the grain spills in. And day after day he grinds whatever grain it was. They made fun. They, they laughed at him. They laughed at his God. They laughed at his people. And the day came that they were having the biggest assemblage that they ever had had. And they brought Samson out to make sport. A target. Just a target. Just a has-been who thought he could carry on without the anointing. Folks, let me say to you and to myself that not by power nor by might. Hello? Hello? I don't care how long you've been in the church. I don't care how long you've been around the church. I don't care how great experiences you have in the past had in God. Hello? Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit. It's the anointing that makes all the difference in the world. And the anointing requires that every day I fellowship his presence. Every day I seek his face. Every day I inquire of him. I reach out as it were to catch his hand or let him hold my hand. Lead me, Lord. The thoughts that I think, please let me acknowledge your lordship in all things. Let me, Lord, think what you want me to think. Speak what you want me to speak and do what you want me to do because I need your presence. Presence. I need your anointing. I need to behold your glory because I'm a target. And so are you. I'm a target. 
there are those that lie in wait. I know what it is. We're going to talk on a natural level. Uh, I know what it is to be betrayed, betrayed by friends, betrayed by loved ones, betrayed by misinformed brethren, betrayed by a phrase nobody likes to use anymore, false brethren. Hello? I, I know what that is. But that's nothing when your own flesh betrays you. We have, we are in war, we have enemies, and we need to know who those enemies are. What did Paul say, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, spirits, wickedness in high places. Jesus said to his two Two out of, the, out of the inner three of his circle, James and John, whenever they approach Samaria, and in their mind, James and John, the Samaritans were not showing proper respect for Jesus. Back in Moses' day, uh, God moved upon a couple of guys whose names I can't recall at the moment in the camp, and they begin to prophesy, and Joshua says, My Lord, Moses, stop! them. He was jealous for Moses' sake for fear that they were going to maybe absorb some of the leadership and take a little of the loyalty the people had away from Moses. And Moses looked at him and he said, are you envious or jealous for my sake? I would to God all of his people were prophets. Joshua was concerned about the people perhaps not responding Respecting the man of God as he thought they should. James and John were concerned. The Samaritans aren't receiving him with the respect that he should have. And so they said, Lord, would you have us call fire down out of heaven and consume them? Now that's biblical. But just because something happened once upon a time in the Bible don't mean it ought to happen again in your anger. Hello? Hello? And Jesus looked at them with this statement and he said, you don't know what spirit you are of. In other words, you've just become an unsuspecting target. A thought has struck your mind and you don't know where it come from. Words have come out of your mouth and you don't know who put them there? Hello? Now, I'm convinced if he could tell James and John, two of the inner three, that, there's been times he could and has said that to me. You don't see clearly. You don't understand. But they were ambushed even of their loyalty. They were attacked. They were targeted just as David was set as the target to be killed, not because of transgression, not because of sin, but simply and solely because of the anointing of God that was on his life. If it were not for the anointing, Saul would have never bothered with him. But it was the anointing. It was the plan and the purpose of God for David's future that caused him to be targeted. Take him out. And I want to say to you tonight, who sit under the sound of my voice, whether you are sanctuary or you're watching a screen somewhere, it is merely God's anointing and plan for your life, the potential that you have in the kingdom that causes you to be targeted by the adversary. Were it not for the anointing, you wouldn't bother him in the least. But thank God for the anointing. Thank God for the purpose. Thank God for the kingdom. Thank God for the promise. Thank God for the presence of God, regardless of who targets me. Hello? Abel was targeted before he ever got to the field. Cain had already had an encounter with God and he didn't like what God had to say. And his response was in anger 
God asked him, why are you so angry? Genesis 4. Sin crouches or lieth at the door, and its desire is to have you. It is unto you, but you shall rule over it. In other words, you can if you will. How many of you know that that besetting sin doesn't have to continue besetting? How many of you know that that weight doesn't have to continue to weigh you down? You can take control over it if you will. And if thou doest good, shall you not be accepted? You would think if Almighty God himself, who could speak in such fatherly, affectionate tones, would speak to that guy, that he would see his error and seek a new beginning. But he didn't. He went out from the presence of the Lord. He and his brothers in the field, and his brother has no idea that he's already been targeted for murder. And he him. Just like David, it was the anointing on Abel's life that caused Satan, who possessed Cain by that time, to move Cain to kill his brother Abel. The Bible says, and why did Cain slay his brother? Because his brother's deeds were righteous and his were not. It was the anointing of God. Cain would have loved to have taken a rock to God that day that God confronted him about his anger and confronted him about sins uh, crouching. Uh, but he couldn't take a rock to God, but he could take a rock to a photo. He could take a rock to a man made in the image and the likeness of God that wanted to be right with God, that wanted to please God, that had devoted his life to God. And that's why Satan moves, uh, amen, to, to take advantage of you and I. I'm not saying that we have individuals. That, that don't matter. At best, they are just the hands of a spirit. Hello, we don't have any control over adults. Really, we don't. In fact, I saw a sign the other day that makes me know that many parents don't even have any control over the kids. I'm driving along behind this car, and this great big old sign on the back of his van says, my dog's better disciplined than your child. I was in PetSmart the other day to get a water filter for my wife's cat. It's my wife's cat, but he won't stay out of my lap. I tell him, I said, cat, if you knew my history with cats, you'd stay as far from me as you could. I saw a sign. It said $120 for a six-week discipline training course for your dogs. $120. So I went to the counter. I said, ma'am, I saw your sign. We went over it. She said, yeah, that, that's what we do. I said, would it be the same price if I brought some granddaughters? <laughs> just, just funny, you know. But we don't have any control over adults. Uh, I remember telling my boys years ago uh, after I had given them a good thrashing with the belt, and I said, now, the day will come We'll put this aside. And the only influence I will have in your life is your respect for my opinion. Do you know that's the only influence a pastor has in an adult's life? Is your respect for their opinion. And didn't, do the, didn't the pastor do a grand job Sunday night? Oh, man, I say Sunday night. I think it was night when he got through. <laughs> no, not really. Bless his heart. We are targeted by enemies, but those enemies are not human beings. I refuse to be any individual's enemy. Now, they may make up their mind that they're going to be an enemy to me, but that's their problem, not mine. 
But I do recognize I have enemies. Now, I had a very detailed outline that the prince and the power of the air swallowed up in a computer that wouldn't cooperate. So I'm just boring you. I'm just skipping a stone across the water and just touches every now and then. I'm trying my best to stay on course. Bear with me. Deuteronomy chapter 20. I do remember that. If you gentlemen could put it up for me. Chapter 20, I believe, beginning in verse 1, we go down to about verse 3, verse 4. The Bible says, when you go out to meet your enemy, you go out to battle against thine enemies, and you see horses, chariots, and that you're vastly outnumbered. Horses, chariots, and people more than you. Your first thought is, oh, my mercies, what have I got myself into? But he says, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Next verse, gentlemen. And it shall be when you come nigh unto the battle that the priest, the man of God, shall approach and speak unto the people next verse, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your heart be faint, fear not, do not tremble, and do not be terrified because of them, horses, chariots, and far outnumbering people. Next verse. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies. And I love that last phrase. And to save you, to deliver you. Hello, make a way for you. Lord, deliver me, defend me, deliver me, save me from bloodthirsty men who lie in wait for my soul, not because I've done them wrong, not because of sin or transgression, but simply because your anointing is in my life, simply because I like to sing songs of praise to you, simply because you have called me to be a king. Our enemies aren't horses and chariots and people. But we do have three enemies, Satan, the world, and your own flesh. That's the wicked triumphant, that's the triumphant, the, the wicked trio as it were. The Bible says that your adversary, the devil, what is that, First Peter chapter, help me, 5 verse 8, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfastly in the faith, knowing that this is no special deal. Your brothers all through the world have the same ordeal going. At least we don't have to worry that when we come to a wedding, there's going to be some uh, fanatic strapped with a uh, suicide vest to walk out into the midst of everybody and pull it. One grandfather who was trying to scrape up the pieces of his little boy whose face was blowed so off that he couldn't even recognize him, he just kept saying, if I could just find all the pieces of my son. If I, I'm all, they were targeted. Some young man who swallowed the lie of so many virgins in heaven, if he'd just be martyred for, hello, Allah. Ooh, my address, you want that too? But you're welcome, you know. It's just a fact. We are privileged in America. Thus far, lawlessness is abounding. Hello? Take a look at our society. It's deteriorating moment by moment. Hello? 
We've never seen such lawlessness as we've watched take place in the last two years. From the top down, Dayton, Ohio, California, Texas, vicious, violent, crazed in their mind, people who've targeted, as it were, innocents. They never did them any harm. They never hurt them. They never threatened them. But they wanted to kill as many as they could. Let me tell you, my friend, if the devil could, he'd take you out in a heartbeat. He went straight to the throne of God and said, Job worshiped you for one reason and one reason only. You keep a hedge around him and I can't get to him. You just let me get a hold of him and just like I did in the garden with Adam and Eve, I'll convince him to curse you and blaspheme you to your face targeted a good man a great man a wise man a wealthy man a God fearing man who prayed and made sacrifices daily for his children for adventure they may have transgressed God in their partying he had no idea what was going on in heaven nobody ever told him all he knows is one day all of a sudden he has no strength all of a sudden there's all kinds of boils breaking out on him all he knows is that he gets a message your horses are all dead your cattle are all dead your sheep are all dead and while he's staggering with these uh, the next thing a wind out of heaven oh isn't that convenient blame God for everything a wind out of heaven blew the house where they were gathered down and all of your children are dead and I'm only here because the devil wanted me to send you this message you've been targeted hello and then his own wife looking at him in all of his misery and you got to give the lady the benefit of the doubt. I don't think she was a vixen. I don't think that she was a mean-spirited woman. I think it was out of compassion that looked at him and said, Job, why don't you curse your God and die? You know you'll die if you curse him, so just, just get out of this. And he looked at her and he said, Oh, wife, you speak as a foolish woman. Have we not received blessings of the Lord? Shall we not also accept this as well? Come on, folks. That's the way the true God-fearing God God-loving, God-serving people of the ages have looked at it. They just have an unshakable faith. It doesn't matter come what will. God's going to make it work out right in this little space called time or in the endless space called eternity. If I can just keep my head pointed in the right direction. If I can just keep my heart in tune with him. If I can just stay joined to the Lord. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So if I can become one spirit with the Lord in my thinking, in my emotions, in my, in my daily life, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Joseph was targeted. Why? And he was targeted by his own brethren. Who misunderstood? Now, God didn't wipe them out. He cleaned them up. Hello? You ever got mad at a sibling and wished that you could just wipe them out, take them out, get rid of them? But after a while, you realize that's not really what you wanted. Hello? You ever get that way about anybody in the kingdom? Hello? Uh, I, I, I know where to put the dagger under the fifth rib, you know, but I'm not allowed to do that. I've been targeted. So you just go with it. Defend me, Lord. Deliver me, Lord. Deliver me, Lord. Save me, O Lord, my God. It's not because I did them wrong. It's not because I did anybody in harm. I told someone the other day, I said, you know, I really could get along with anybody that would give me half a chance. I could get along with the devil if he didn't crowd me. You know? But uh, there just comes a time when he does crowd you. Joseph is targeted because God's anointed him. Those weren't Joseph's dreams we talk about. Joseph just happened to get tuned into God's dreams. Joseph didn't know to dream about sheaves bowing and his standing. 
He had no idea of the sun and the moon and the stars. Uh, amen. Doing obeisance to him. God planned all of that. And whenever his brothers heard, and then to add injury to insult, when they saw their father put up on Joseph the coat of many colors, which means he's dad's favorite. Hmm? You ever had ill thoughts about the favorite kid? The uh, mama's pet? Daddy's pet? Human nature. And when they see him coming alone by himself, they don't dare do anything around dad. Nothing. But when he's out there by himself coming to them in the field and they see him afar and they say, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. Then we'll see what his dreams come to. Well, mistake here, boys. Uh, you can't kill him because God's going to preserve him. And it's not his dreams, it's God's dreams. And what was it the wise man said in the... Uh, uh, brain dead, forgive me. The Pharisee council of the Sanhedrin court. He said, now, you might better back off and leave these guys alone. Now, if they not be of God, they're going to just come to nothing anyhow. But if they be of God, you're going to find yourself fighting God. I tell people about husbands, about their wives. You know, that's God's daughter you're married to. And you really don't want any trouble with your father-in-law. <laughs> Knew a man in Mississippi many years ago whose daughter married a guy and she wasn't where she would have been or she wouldn't have married him. It's amazing to me how human emotions can override divine edict to not be unequally yoked together. And folks, just because they come to the same church you go to don't mean you're equal. You need to think in terms of their worship, their faithfulness, their character, their spirituality, their vocabulary. Hello? You, you need to consider all of that. And I told someone the other day, I said, the one thing you don't want, you don't ever want to marry a liar. I digress. I'll blame it on brain fog. You're so gracious. Thank you. Somebody asked me tonight before walking in the sanctuary, when's the last time you spoke? I said, November. It seems like an eternity. Somebody asked me during this period of my life, uh, are you through? Are you finished? I said, what do you mean? I mean, are you through preaching? I said, I hope to God not. I hope not. But this gentleman, his daughter called him up. Dad, can I come home or could you come get me? He said, you're welcome to come home, honey. And when she walked through the door, he couldn't hardly recognize her. Her face had been so brutalized, pummeted, beaten, black eyes, busted and broken nose, swollen and split lips. He said, who did this? She said, uh, it'll be all right, Dad. No, no he said, I'm insisting. Who did this? He said, I already knew. I just wanted my daughter to confirm it. And she did. He said, come on in. We'll take care of you. That night, her now <clears throat> liquid-encouraged, half-drunken, if not fully-drunken husband came to reclaim my wife, my possession. And the brother said to him, now, she's not going to go with you. And you need to go sober up. We'll come and talk like adults. And the guy whips out a snub nose pistol and is going to shoot this father 
And the father slaps the gun out of direct line with his chest. He shoots the girl's mother, this father's wife. When the father got through with him, they took him to the hospital. He stayed in the hospital for several weeks, broken bones and maimed being. And every day the father went up to visit him, told him, said, I'm so sorry, but something happened when you targeted my wife. And acting in defense mode before I realized it, I already beat you half to death. When the guy got out of the hospital, he cleaned his act up, went to the altar, prayed through, got baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, and they had a happy life and raised several children after that. Her father said, I honestly believe I beat the devil out of him. <laughs> targeted. David was targeted. You were targeted. Isaiah the prophet was targeted. Isn't it amazing that Hezekiah and Isaiah were, if not kin, very close. Isaiah was a courtyard preacher. He was a prophet of royalty. He had access to the king at any time. Gave him guidance and direction on numerous occasions. Helped him be spared from the, Babylon, the Assyrians. And then whenever Hezekiah was on his bed of deathbed, Hezekiah, Isaiah received the word. The Lord said, go tell him to prepare his house, get everything in order. He's going to die and surely not live. He told him and then walked out after he delivered his message, which I plan to do if you'll just bear with me a little while. And uh, Hezekiah didn't like the message, so he turned his face to the wall and he wept before the Lord and he reminded God, all the years I have served you and I've kept your word and I have done that which is right in your sight and I want to live. I do not want to die. And God tapped Isaiah on the shoulder and said, go back in, tell him. I heard his prayer. I've seen his tears. I've granted his request. I'll give him 15 years. We need to be careful sometimes what we pray for. Shall we call fire down out of heaven? They're not respecting you like they should. You don't know what spirit you're of. Hezekiah, all the past has been good. So good that God would honor it. But the present is fixing to be a great big mistake. Fifteen more years. He had a child during that period of time. A son who became king when he was 12 years old. 12 years old. That means he was conceived and born during that grace period. His name is Manasseh. He reigned longer than any other king in all of Judah's history. And he was so vile and so wicked that historians say that he literally had Isaiah the prophet tied and pulled into a hollow log and then sawed in sections. He was so vile that God said to Israel, I will never forgive you for what Manasseh has led you to do. He gave permission to do things that were abominable in the sight of God. He didn't make them do it. He just gave them permission. And it revealed the weakness of their own lack of self-denial. All of this happened because instead of saying, thank you, Lord, for telling me what you're going to do and what your will is, instead of saying, not my will, but thine be done, I want to live you Owe me because I've been faithful to you. And Satan gets into that. 
And not only is the king targeted, but so is the kingdom. Open your Bible with me, if you will, to um, Romans chapter 8, verse 35. It's a familiar verse. I won't bring anything new out of it. I just, what Peter say, Second Peter chapter 1, he said, I... Stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. You know all of this. Verse 35 said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he says, Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? These seem to be targeting devices. You've been targeted by tribulation. Distress has found your address. Persecution, however mild or severe, you've perhaps had to stretch a little bit on the groceries. Uh, hadn't been able to buy the latest. Um, life in straits, difficulties, or even threatened. Is that going to separate us from the love of God? He said, next verse, as it is written. And if I recall correctly, it's Psalms 44. You'll find it in the 44 Psalm. As it is written, we are killed. We face death and we die every day. Did you know there's not a day goes by that not just one, but multiple people are killed simply because they profess Christ and not Allah? They didn't done anybody any harm. They just choose to put their faith in him and the best that they know of him they call themselves Christians and as a result of their professed faith they are targeted I don't know if that day will ever come in America or not I know if some evil forces have their way it will but I thank God that his hand is upon us David said, the Lord is my shield. I'm targeted. Satan has targeted you and your family simply because of God's presence in your life and purpose for your life and anointing upon your life. He's targeted the anointing. He's targeted you to act in such a way as to step away from Saul, king of Israel, was anointed just like David. In fact, the Bible says in his anger, God gave them their first king. God literally stepped aside from his word. Saul didn't come from the tribe of Judah. He come from the wrong tribe. He was a Benjaminite. The throne was to be Judah's. The scepter and the rule and the reign was to belong to Judah. But God reached past Judah and picked up a Benjaminite who was just looking for a couple of lost mules. Or donkeys, that'd be the better word. Someone said that um, mules were never intended of God. They're a crossbreed. You can check it, check it out in your scripture. He was a nobody. Oh, he was tall. He was broad. He was big. Maybe that's why God chose a little rudy complected lad the next time he gave him a king. Because Saul, Saul was, he stood out among all of Israel. He was the 
man under the same anointing that David had. You ever seen anybody that one time were anointed and now they live a life as anti-God? Ever seen it? Same anointing, same God, same kingdom. Nobody targeted Saul except Satan. And Satan only targeted him because of God's anointing. And how did he target Saul? First of all, Saul claimed it was fear. Well, Faith and fear are opposite. So if you believe God, you don't have to fear men. If you just got through talking with God this, after, this morning, you don't have to worry about what somebody's going to say this afternoon. But if you haven't talked to God for quite a few days, it might shake your boat when somebody has whatever to say. That's why you need to walk with him every day. You're a target. And Satan's not going to hit you on your best day. He'll catch you on your most awkward moment. Most awkward. And so Saul intrudes into the priest office, offers a sacrifice. Just because you're king doesn't mean you have a right to offer the holy things. In fact, I remember one king that stretched forth his hand in the sanctuary and God smote him with leprosy immediately. God didn't smite Saul. He was merciful to Saul. But Saul set himself on a path that was anti-God. God said, wait, Samuel will be there. Saul intrudes beyond his calling and he no sooner done it than Samuel shows up and says, what have you done? And why have you done it? He had been targeted through his own pride. Why do you say pride, Brother Lashley? Because the next time he went, the prophet looked him in the eye and said, God is sending you to destroy the Amalekites. Now, when you look in the Old Testament, different nations represent different things. God said, I will forever be at war with, them, with Amalek because Amalek represents the sin nature, the I'll do as I'll do, human pride, stubbornness. God said, I will never pardon that. I will. Now, you can turn loose of it and God will pardon you, but God's not going to pardon that spirit of Amalek. He said, go destroy him. Spare nothing. Saul comes back, and not only has he spared the best, I don't know who decided what the best was, not only has he decided to spare the best, use his own ideas instead of God's. He lies about it. He said, I did it for your God. And then when the prophet tells him what the Lord said and turns from him, he rips the prophet's garment he says, come and, and honor me before the people, before the people. Saul was targeted for his own pride. And then you see the rest of his life as he's struggling with the grip that Satan had on his life. Abel was targeted. Joseph was targeted. David was targeted. Saul was targeted. And you and I are targets for God's sake. For God's sake. Nay, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. That is a most powerful statement. The wishy-washy. The I don't know. I'm not sure. I won't make it. I guarantee it because they won't endure unto the end. And the Lord said, he that endureth to the end, not he that comes off the starting blocks. 
Not the 90-day wonder that just everybody wonders, oh, my goodness, what God has blessed us with. Oh, no, no, no. It's that one that endures. And endures means that you're going to go through some things. You're going to be weary. Hello? You're going to have some difficulties. There's going to be some times you, you, you're just literally targeted by the devil and, and he secures a blow. But I am persuaded. <laughs> I love that. That neither death nor life. Someone said that a certain preacher uh, got others together and they boycotted uh, uh, taverns. And uh, one night, a group of the tavern owners came, caught him in his study and told him if he didn't back off and quit bothering them, they was going to kill him. He said he stood up, straightened his suit, and he said, Gentlemen, if you think threatening me with an early trip to glory is going to deter me, you're not thinking. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities. When you talk about angels, you talk about faithful angels. I mean, you know that you have an angel that God has ordained to watch over you. Anybody ever been in a situation that if the angel hadn't have been there, you wouldn't be here? I should hold up both hands. Neither angels, faithful angels, nor fallen angels. That's all demons are. They're fallen angels. And just like God set the, the perimeter of what Satan can do targeting Joseph or, or targeting Job, God has set the perimeter of what the demonic forces can do targeting you. In fact, if you walk with God and keep your relationship with him honorable, when you fail, get up and say, God, that's not the way I want to live. That's the way I used to live. Hello? When you stumble, get back up. Repent. Plead the blood. Tell God, if you'll help me, Lord, I'm going to continue on my walk. I don't care how many devils line up against you. The Bible says you can cast out devils. All you got to do is call on that name. He had a legion of devils. What's a legion? I really can't remember right now, and I hate to venture a guess, but it's a heap of angels. Back during the dark ages, the uh, clergymen would argue, one of their greatest argument was, how many angels can stand on the point of a needle? Well, when you don't have anything important to say, I guess you can pick up the whatever. But a legion possibly a thousand or more, couldn't keep that one man from running to Jesus, falling down before him, and the scripture says, and worshiping him. With that many devils. So the old idea that the devil made me do it or the devil won't let me do it or, come on folks, that's just a cop out. Neither angels, faithful or fallen, principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stand with me. You are a target for God's sake, for the kingdom's sake. You've been the recipients of grace and mercy and forgiveness, cleansing by the blood, fullness of the spirit. God has great plans for you. How he wants to bless you. You parents, how he wants to bless your children. You grandparents, how he wants to bless your grandchildren. And because of that, Satan has targeted you. The world system, I didn't get there. If pastor will let me come back and pick up the scraps. And, and the Bible says, stir up the gift that is in you. And translators say, rekindle the flame. And I read one uh, scholar that said, it gives you the picture 
in your mind, if you can imagine a fireplace and the coals have been scattered and so the white ash is covering them as they are dying out and somebody that wants heat in the house comes over and gathers them back together. That's what rekindling the fire. Come on, gather all your commitment back to God. Gather all of your focus back to God. Gather all of your faith and your love and your trust and your confidence in God. Gather it back together. Now, if the pastor will allow me to gather the scraps, maybe between my sons or my son-in-law, they'll be able to get my computer to allow me to get to what I've written for the last two days and I won't be just skipping rocks I love you thank you for putting up with me you don't know what this particular moment means to me and I had hoped and wished that I'd be at my best at least have a staff to lean on John told me, John, Jonathan, my son, he told me, he said, Dad, you cannot accept any invitations to preach anywhere until after you preached in Peoria because we want to know how it affects you. Well, I hope it hasn't adversely affected me. I haven't been near as emotional delivering what I could as I was trying to get what I couldn't out of a computer. I don't mind telling you. I told Alice, I said, I am fighting hell. But here I be, and you're so merciful. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.